Hello, my name is Tudia. I am speaking to you from Atlanta, Georgia because I am a PhD student at the Georgia Institute of Technology and this presentation for GRUX is um, about my summer project with the Xbox Research and Design team. I am a design researcher and I am interested in inclusion and innovation um, in healthcare, which has nothing to do with what I did over the summer and which is why I am super excited to talk about it. Um, so I've compiled about 10 checkpoints based on um, how we think of cultural representation in games and how we can be better at it as creators. So as creators, when we approach other cultures in games, the, um, the tendency is to think about uh, is to think about the other culture as exotic, as novel, and as most critical theorists and post-colonialists -colonialists will tell you um, about um, this way of approaching culture is that we focus on what is exotic. Um, and when we focus on what is exotic as creatives, we think of our interpretation of uh, what would make it uh, more artistic, more interesting, and definitely more um, more, ex more more novel and delightful for um, our audience. But we are, as cultural ambassadors, also prejudiced by um, our own exposure. And um, I would highly suggest looking at this book, which is a funny take on um, on stereotypes, uh, where the artist um, Yanko Svetkov, I think, has um, and he put together these maps of places uh, based on how cultures think of those geographies. And in some ways, as 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 game designers, we are creating these worlds based on maps we carry in our mind of what a culture looks like, right? And some of these maps are highly misinformed um, because how much can all of us know and check at each point? As as we approach different cultures, though, the representation of different uh, voices become really important, especially when these voices cannot access these platforms themselves. Um, they cannot speak for themselves, so we speak for them. Um, this becomes even more important when those voices have been misrepresented in the past, right? So as makers of content, our responsibility pretty much falls into two spaces. One is to respect the cultural sentiment of that group, but to also uphold the game's intended experience through that respectful encounter. Um, keeping that in mind, I started this project by um, asking uh, our group, as well as um, reflexively, how we can inform an authentic and delightful experience for the gaming studio to create um, and recreate this new culture in their world while players try to explore this open world. Meaning there has to be enough discovery and novelty um, and of course delight, but it has to be authentic. Um, and I, uh, I looked at three specific areas. One was how would we recreate the setting of that culture in the game world. The second would be interactions with that game world. And a third surprising area, which was to look at the discussions that were generated in the community around it. So discovering a lost volcano in Hawaii or a tomb that you want to excavate in Peru, all of it suggests exoticism and novelty. But those settings have to have interactions that do with it, that, that do what the game wants to um, do, uh, as well as the gamer wants to do within that game. But um, the discussions that it generates uh, around those interactions, as well as those settings, outlive the game itself, and that's a pretty important part of this conversation. So when we think about a setting, it helps to think about that setting we're creating in the game as a synecdoche. GRE word alert. So what do I mean when I say synecdoche? I mean that referring to a car as wheels makes sense because wheels are part of the car. But a car can also be referred to as a whip. And um, a whip is pretty much a carryover from the days of, of a whip to chase a buggy down the street. But we're no longer in those times. And as much as it has a cool trivia reference point, it can um, it, it can cause confusion because it no longer has any resemblance to the actions you want to take today by driving a car, right? So um, careful how we represent a, a setting in a way that is um, both evocative of the place but also evocative of it now. Um, a second is that based on how it, it, it connects to a setting, the interactions for a gamer can um, can set up an expectation of that culture as well as an expectation of the game, right? It is 
it is really unlikely that I'm playing um, GDA and I expect to, uh, to, to follow rules um, as I would in the real world. But there are certain leakages that happen between the game world and the real world. And this is particularly true when you have an experience type culture firsthand. Um, Peter Mendelssohn makes a great point about how that happens in reading. Uh, where he talks about uh, how even a reader has agency, has the ability to choose what the metaphor means, has the ability to focus on certain points, and in some ways, when you create certain metaphors in a in a in a game, they are pretty much handing that control over to um, to a player in terms of how they interpret the game and how they interpret actions. So we have to be careful about how we represent a culture on that front when it comes to player agency. And the third area is to think about discussions as a place where um, the game can frame which voices um, get heard and which, uh, uh, you know, which parts of the discussion take, um, you know, become the focal point of a debate. So um, in, a, in a community, and I think those are things to, to keep in mind um, when we create certain choices uh, about the game's personality as well as the expectations within gaming communities. So moving forward, to the, to the 10 checkpoints. Um, the guiding questions I started with for this research study was, um, I, I clearly couldn't speak to the uh, to, to specific representatives of the culture because um, this was a hush-hush, under the labs project, it was really early days. So I looked at qualitative themes based on uh, lead gamer opinions, critical gamer reviews, um, and I started by asking what were things they thought would honor the culture that I was um, looking to represent in you know, through this gaming studio. Um, what were the historical references they found delightful, that they thought were authentic and actually represented how they thought of themselves. Um, the second was to understand the points of tension at the other end of the spectrum. Um, what was the media critical about? What was the representation, um, you know, pointing to in terms of maybe colonial pressures, as well as things that were sensitive points for that particular culture. And finally, because this gaming studio and this game intended to bridge cultures, um, we looked at broad pitfalls to consider and avoid when representing the location itself and the culture you know, associated with that, uh, with that place in the game. Um, to start with, it's really important to note that it's not just caution that we need to take with, you know, to, to take, it's not just the cautious approach that we need to take when we look at representing cultures in games, it is also um, a lot of affection because the cultures that we look to represent are usually very hungry to be represented. People from these cultures have not been represented before, so a caring representation really matters because this may be uh, the time that we get to celebrate that culture, right? So I have six such principles. The first is as much as we care about the differences between cultures, the thing that always works is relatability. So universal experiences create that relatability. Humor is a big one. I mean, I remember watching Zootopia in a, in, a, in a theater with kids and adults, and the kids were laughing because it was a slow slog, but the adults were laughing because, boy, who hasn't been at the DM, right? And bridging those two cultures was, um, and, and you can argue that parents and kids come from different cultures at this point, um, was a genius move in terms of understanding how that scene would play out. And we need more of those relatable encounters when we think of universal experiences. The second is um, to think about the specificity of cultural encounters in certain settings. In Assassin's Creed, an assassin can kill someone in, in certain places and bury the body, but he will not do that within a church. There is um, a lot of respectful interactions um, you know, that have been constructed as side quests in the game. Um, you can scale this church, but you won't go inside. Um, which is exactly how a local would expect to interact with this space, right? Um, third point is to focus more on contemporary intersections. So, you know, this example here sets up a fictional fictional place, and they have introduced a fictional um, aspect of, uh, of, of cowgirls there, um, which are unlikely in the 20th century. And even if they were, it is not a front and center conversation. It's been brought into the story. Um, to honor the fact that today there are more there are women gamers and we want to include them, put them front and center. And centralizing these contemporary intersections matters a lot more than um, standing on ground with historical divisions. Mind you, this is still in the in in the realm of what we were trying to do, which is to bridge cultures, right? 
Now the fourth is to um, honor traditions. Um, sure, you know there is um, there is a traditional aspect to every culture that we want to bring in, but it needs to be authentic in the sense that it has to tie into daily customs. Now this scene in Coco could have featured tacos instead they chose tamales and that is the sensitivity of um of understanding that tamales are more often eaten by more people in um in mexico right um another point is to start looking for opportunities within the stories and interaction points that challenge stereotypes um is a rat considered the cleanest animal no but at the same time, there is an anthropocentric view. And here's a story where a rat wants to cook, and that is not just cute, but also educational and thinking about um, how we have certain prejudices and ideas that we impose upon stereotypes and characters, right? Um, a sixth point, and a very crucial point, is to work with the community that you are representing. Now, here's a game called Queering Space Time, um, which is about uh, dating simulations and a, and a role play for uh, for girls to meet across space time. Um, it is for the queer community, but it is also based on several profiles from the community, and that's an example of how you get um, a lot more representation of uh, of real life experiences, but also in the process you involve the community in in the creative process, right? Um, now, as a mirror image of these, I've got four um, points of caution when representing cultures. Uh, this is more to reinstate certain points I've already made, um, and this caution is uh, is even more so important when a when a minority has not been represented before. Um, like people of color have not made it to Disney movies much, and when they did decide to put a Disney princess up, um, Tiana was mostly a frog in that story. Now. It, it does not seem like an intentional reduction, but it kind of is um, because it, it, it seems like lip service um, in, in that sense. The second is, um, is to keep in mind uh, not to superficially resolve political themes. Now, border immigration is a burning issue and has been for a very long time. It comes up in many games, especially in the US with border crossing. So many other things we can we can talk about, but here's an interesting example of a game that chose to create um, you know parallels for players with uh, with border patrol um, to to give them an understanding of how complicated this issue can get, um, and instead of trying to superficially resolve it, they gave them very complex situations to to weigh the you know to weigh the consequences. Um, Related to this aspect is also perpetuating certain traditions without asking, you know, locals. As much as the Highland Games seem really cool and they, they do continue in in um, in Scotland to the, till date, um, they, you know, a critic really took offense at how the Scots have been represented as as this boorish wild men out there, um, you know compared to how they see themselves um, in, in this movie, even if it was, you know, put way out there in the past, because how many movies do you have about the Scottish, especially when it comes to um, Scottish fairy tales like this one. Um, and finally, as the last point here, is to be aware of cultural stereotypes. As much as we may think of uh, certain notions of a certain uh, of, of specific cultures, those notions may not be as representative of the culture and may even be reinforced by, um, let's just say, colonial voices. Um, so when we represent, we want to make a clear choice where we stand, um, either in furthering those stereotypes or in overturning them. I would strongly suggest avoiding those stereotypes. Um, for example, many critics of this game uh, and gamers themselves have pointed out how this is supposed to be a Overwatch. Uh, it's supposed to be a futuristic version of the city of Giza, but it still has symbols about ancient Egypt because when we think of Egypt, we think of ancient, ancient Egypt based on uh, textbooks and many references in other cultural mediums. Um, to sum up, my point is to uh, is, is, is to most gaming studios to pick that position because if you don't, your gaming communities will for you. And, uh, you know, those, those conversations will define 
how your game is discussed and the aura of the game overall, right? So as a final point and something that the gaming studio I was speaking to as part of this project, um, they also decided to do this, was to hire a cultural consultant. I mean, Pixar's done it. So many others have done it. If you don't know about our culture, be humble, go find someone who knows about the culture and bring them on board. Um, work with the user research team because they're usually pretty good at generating questions, um, questions and asking and making things strange that seem familiar, um, which I'm glad to say you know, this gaming studio was, was on to do. Um, and to sum up, those questions about settings, playability and discussions usually lead to a more respectful and delightful representation of of a culture within a game world. Uh, thank you so much for listening and this opportunity to speak with you guys. I hope you found it useful. I hope you bring more cultures into games and build the bridges that we need to appreciate all the things that make us unique as cultures. <laughs>